Good morning or afternoon or evening to everyone again. Um, welcome to the second lecture on gender in the sciences. Uh, so today we're going to get through Keller's essay on uh, gender and science. Um, and what we're going to look at here is a, I guess a fairly traditional view regarding gender in the sciences. Um, you know, a much more conservative view, I think, than what we're going to see next week with uh, uh, Sandra Harding and then this example from primatology with Sandra Blaffer Hardy. Um, what you get from Keller is, uh, yeah, I think a much more traditional or conservative view. So we'll examine this today and then we'll go into uh, more um, contemporary uh, more progressive views regarding gender in the science. Um, again, not to say that they're any, any more correct or not, but they certainly take a different stance regarding gender in the sciences than Keller does. So part of this at the end here is going to be comparing and contrasting these two views of how uh, issues of gender relate to the sciences and whether issues of gender are relevant to the sciences. So, um, yeah, so before we start in the lecture, just so you know, some bookkeeping stuff looking forward. So I had sent out an email to everyone, uh, well, it would have been Monday. Um, right, so if you, uh, if you would like, there are now PDF copies of the PowerPoint slides available for all of the lectures. Um, yeah, there, uh, there's a, a subfolder if you go into the lectures folder where you're watching this from. You should have seen the, the subfolder that says lecture PDFs. You can look in there, click on those. Those are the PDFs. They're just the, uh, the PowerPoint slides without audio or anything like that. Um, I know for some people that, that, that's easier to reference than just going back and skipping through a video. Um, also, if you wanted to print them out for whatever reason, you can certainly do that there as well. So yeah, so PDF copies of the lectures. Likewise, I'd said in the same email, that uh, some people have been having problems with the Cultura videos uploaded to Blackboard. They were not loading as well as videos on YouTube. So I just created a YouTube channel for the course. So everything, uh, once a video is uploaded to Blackboard, it'll also be uploaded as a PDF to Blackboard and it'll also be uploaded to the uh, YouTube channel for the course as well. Um, I had uh, sent everyone the link for the YouTube channel. If you lost that, just contact me and I'll send it to you again. Um, technically the videos aren't marked as private or anything, but they're not gonna show up if you just search YouTube for like Professor Ellinger's philosophy of science class. I don't have it like completely open to the public just because I was getting a lot of spam comments from uh, various sources. So they're still accessible to anyone who has the, the web address, um, but they won't come up if you just search YouTube for, for my class or for philosophy of science. Uh, Merton essays. Um, yeah, you know, sort of just to keep it sort of in-house with us. Uh, plus, some of the stuff is, it, it's not a, you know, if we discuss, you know, if you look at the discussion on uh, on, on uh, Monday's class for, you know, issues of gender in the science, it isn't a general discussion for, you know, sort of general use of gender in the sciences. It starts out with an explanation of our uh, our final essay, which, you know, might not be helpful to someone else just looking for a summary of gender and the sciences on YouTube. So yeah, if you uh, if you lost that 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 email, just contact me and I'll send you the link again. I know some of you have, have been subscribed to the, the page and that's great. Uh, so if they're easier to, to read there um, and, to, and to check out there, you certainly can. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions about any of that or is having any problems accessing anything for whatever reason, let me know. Uh, yeah, so along with that, so right, last response paper is due on Monday on issues that we're going to be dealing with today, this genderization of the sciences. So some of the things we talked about on Monday, but also today's discussion, that's going to make up the, the stuff that you need to answer the question for response paper six. So um, yeah, I hate to do that back to back, have response paper six due before you get feedback on response paper five. Well, I mean, you'll get feedback for response paper five over the weekend. So between now and Monday, I'll have response paper five graded for you. You won't have to wait till Monday for me to pass it back like we were in class. Uh, so you'll get some feedback prior to Monday's class. And again, remember the response paper six isn't due until the end of the day on Monday. So 11.59 p.m. So you'll definitely have some feedback. And I'll discuss, uh, like I did with the, the, uh, um, the quiz, um, I'll discuss some common errors or, or go over the, um, Response paper five at the beginning of the lecture on Monday, so you'll have some feedback. So response paper six then is due on Monday. The question is in the syllabus still. You can check that out there. Um, as a reminder, so remember, if you look at the syllabus, only the top five response papers are graded. I dropped the lowest grade. So 
everybody got full credit for response paper four. That was because we had to extend spring break and um, uh, there just wasn't enough time to, 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 to do six response papers. So uh, I gave everyone full credit for response paper four. So you have a 20 out of 20 for that. And then your other four grades. Um, right. So I guess all this is to say that if you're happy with your first four grades and, re and that 20 out of 20 for response paper four, there's no reason to do response paper six. Uh, I only take the top five. So if you're happy with your four and that 20 out of 20 and you say, this is great. This is what I want for my, my you know, my grades for my response papers. There's no requirement that you do response paper six. Um, yeah, if you don't turn it in, I'll just mark it in as a zero, and that'll be your lowest grade that will then get dropped. Um, so yeah, this is great for those of you who had done well in the previous response papers. If you'd like a little extra time to work on the final essay, or if you have something for another class, you can just say, you know what, I'm good with my first five response papers. I don't need to do response paper six. And again, just don't upload it to Blackboard. There's no reason to email me and let me know uh, anything of, uh, uh, of that nature. Like I said, if I go to grade response paper six and I don't get uh, response paper six from you. If there's nothing uploaded to Blackboard for it, it'll just get entered as a zero, and then uh, yeah, it'll just get dropped as your final, as your lowest grade. So um, right, and I mean obviously though, if you missed a response paper earlier in the semester, uh, if you already used that free one that's going to be dropped, or you decided you didn't do as well on one earlier as you would have liked, and you want that one dropped, obviously then you would have to do response paper six due Monday. Um, but yeah, that's totally up to you. And again, you don't have to let me know if you're not going to do it. Um, right. Then finally, yeah, the final essay. So I got some questions regarding the final essay handout. Um, if anybody has any other questions, shoot me an email. One thing, uh, well, first of all, there's no final exam, just the final essay. We went over this earlier in the semester. I'm not sure how final exams are working for your other classes, because I, honestly, I don't do them. Uh, I just really do final essays, and especially for these classes, they're all writing intensive, so it makes sense to do a final essay. Uh, but right, no final exam or anything like that that you need to study for. Just focus on the final essay and have that in by the deadline. Um, also, someone had asked, and I, I meant to say this, and it, it is listed in the, the final essay handout, but just to make it clear, you know, I give you those three prompts that you can pick one of the three to work with, but you're not bound to answering one of those three questions. If there's something else that you're interested in answering, certainly shoot me an email and say, hey, I'd like to pursue this topic instead. I, some, someone had asked if they could pursue uh, a topic related to this credit economy and the sciences and then do some outside research. Now, obviously, that would be a bit more work, but if it's something that you're interested in, I think that, that type of, of uh, independent work really pays off. Um, yeah, so just let me know and we can talk about that and the possibilities of doing that. Uh, but again, yeah, right. So no final exam, just the final essay. If you don't want to work on one of the, the, the chosen prompts, feel free to contact me to pick a, a, to talk about it. A, a, alternative topic but don't feel like you can't you know those three or most of you will use those three that are there uh, one of those three so that's fine but if you want to do something else let me know cool so if you have any questions about any of that shoot me an email set up some time to meet via zoom uh, and we can do that um cool so yeah so like i said this is you know a relatively older view than some of the other stuff that we're working with we'll talk about where this is situated in the history of uh feminism in a second what you get from Keller is a fairly traditional view uh, regarding gender in the sciences that the sciences should be gender neutral. In other words, that we should be working to uh, remove gender distinctions in the science, or that science should not be focused at all on the gender of the scientist, on the gender of the uh, um, observation being made in the sense of like primatology and things like this, or in gender uh, sort of, uh, of imposing gender stereotypes onto scientific work or imposing gendered language onto scientific work. So essentially what Keller's position is, is that we should, we, we should have this sort of like equality of the genders in the sciences. We should remove gender from the sciences, in, you know, in total, right? So yeah, Evelyn Fox Keller, uh, her personal biography is, is amazing. Uh, she's first generation uh, daughter of Russian immigrants born in Queens in the 1930s. Uh, yeah, she has her PhD in theoretical physics from Harvard. So again, you can see it, what I had said before is like, as we're going forward, we're sort of moving away from philosophers who are focused on the sciences and more on scientists who are focused on philosophical questions here, questions of gender and the sciences. Yeah, so I mean, her teaching career is is equally as impressive as her PhD. Cornell, University of Maryland, Northeastern, Northwestern, SUNY, Princeton, NYU, UC Berkeley, 
Um, she's also the recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship, what are commonly known as the Genius Grants in 1992, and specifically a Genius Grant for her work in the philosophy of science, right? So not for her maybe more scientific work, but for the stuff that she's doing here, right? So an acknowledgement, not just for uh, her role as a scientist, but her role on it, focusing on issues of gender in the sciences. Um, I don't know what it was then. Now a MacArthur Fellowship is like 500 to $600,000, just free money. Um, they, there's no stipulations on how you deal with it. They write you a check for half a million dollars basically and say like, go do good things with it. And again, it's not just in the sciences, it's in the humanities and the arts. Um, I think Lin-Manuel Miranda might've been the recipient of a genius grant, the guy that wrote Hamilton, uh, but playwrights, authors, artists, uh, people working in social work, people working in urban planning. It really runs the gambit of, 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 uh, academic and, and, and professional careers. Um, and yeah, you just sort of get a call one day. It's like, hey, you're the, you're the recipient. You don't really know that you're even under consideration. So um, yeah, a very, very, very prestigious honor, especially to be, to be recognized for the work she's doing here. So what's the work then that she's doing here? Um, yeah, this, so this essay is a chapter out of a larger work called Reflections on Gender and Science. Uh, if you can find a copy of it, it's a very good uh, outside source for that third topic for the final essay. Um, there are some other essays here that, that might be effective. Um, yeah, I don't know. I tried to look at the library's website to see if they have a, uh, a, a digital copy of it, and apparently they do not, or at least it wasn't abundantly, it wasn't easy to find. Now, if anybody's interested, I might suggest contacting the library, talk to a librarian and see about getting a, an ebook copy of this. Uh, they might have access to one from some other library but I wasn't able to find one uh, just by a, a, a sort of a cursory search of the library's website. But this is one chapter out of a larger book on issues of gender and sciences. Uh, but yeah, it would be a very good outside source if you were looking for one for that third topic on the, the final essay. Yeah, so essentially what she does here is she's gonna first look at like uh, the, this discussion of these stereotypes associated with gender uh, and the sciences that we had talked about on Monday. Right, so this erroneous idea that the sciences and reason are the sort of the domain of men and associated with masculinity in a way that uh, the emotions, subjectivity, irrationality are associated with like with women and femininity, right? These sort of socially constructed gender stereotypes, uh, harmful gender stereotypes that we had discussed on, uh, on Monday. Yeah, so she starts out right near the beginning of the essay with this quote, that the association of masculinity with scientific thought has the status of a myth which cannot or should not be examined. She refers to it as both self-evident and nonsensical. So she says, like, yeah, it's self-evident because, like, I think I mentioned this on, on Monday, right? None of this is, should be foreign to us. It's not like any of us are writing down these gender stereotypes. Like, oh, I never heard of this before. Right? These are very common, very harmful, but very common gender stereotypes that have played out throughout human history. Um, if you take uh, a class in aesthetics, I hope to teach aesthetics again soon, it's sort of what I do. Um, we do a few weeks on gender in the arts and one of those is discussions of how gender roles and how genders and, and, and women and men are depicted in the arts. And it's often historically this idea of the active or protector male and the sort of the passive submissive female. Right, so these gender stereotypes seem to be self-evident. We find them everywhere; they are obvious. Uh, I didn't need it, it, I didn't need a whole lot of, of discussion to convince you that these gender stereotypes exist. Right, they are out there in the world. Uh, these are not just in the sciences. It says they're so, sort of self-evident, and they're also nonsensical. They're self-evident because everybody knows it, but they're nonsensical because it flies in the face of, of this neutrality of the sciences. That the, that, 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 that the sciences in some ways associated with masculinity or, or men um, seems to fly in the face of, of those uh, scientific norms that we had discussed when we were discussing Merton, and when we were discussing the sociology of science, right? We had said one of these norms is um, impartiality, uh, where you know one uh, does not care who uh the who the voice is making the the um uh the claim what matters is the claim itself right so what keller argues then is like if this the, this gender these gender stereotypes this genderization of the sciences flies in the face of that neutrality well we should remove it right? we should remove 
uh, gender distinctions in the sciences. We should remove considerations regarding the gender of the scientists. We should remove gendered language from the sciences. We should remove this view that science is associated with men and masculinity. So, yeah, I mentioned like where this sits within the history of feminism. Her arguments here are, are certainly a, a sort of a second wave feminist argument. So, oh, excuse me. So what does this mean? Oh, sorry, doing a lot of lectures here. Um, so what does this mean? Um, yeah, if you had, if you're not a, a gender studies major, if you took a class in gender studies or the history of feminism, uh, these terms and this this sort of chronology might be familiar to you. And if so, I apologize for sort of a, a, a brief, uh, sort of broad review here. We generally define different eras of feminism as different waves of feminism is what we talk about. So in this very brief history of feminism, we start with what's called first wave feminism, right? the initial push for equality among the sexes. Um, we identify this probably starting with uh, Seneca Falls in the 1840s, I believe. Uh, but generally, if you're looking for a time period, this would be the 19th century and the early 20th century. Most uh, predominantly first wave feminism is focused on women's right to vote. That seems to be like the main issue of first wave feminism. And it's indicative of uh, a larger focus on on public equality for women in the in, in first wave feminism. So certainly voting rights, um, the right to run for elected office, not just to vote for men, but to run for office oneself. Uh, property rights that one protected and re retained one's own personal property uh, when one marries, for instance. Right. So all very very sort of public sphere concerns. When we get into the 1960s through the 1980s. Um, focus on, on what we call second wave feminism, right? So here you get like, you know, the, the, the uh, sexual liberation in the 1960s, bra burnings, uh, looking at workplace inequalities, looking more at individual rights, so reproductive rights. This is when, you know, you get Roe versus Wade. This is when you get uh, a fight for uh, access to contraceptive, uh, contraception, uh, issues of uh, consent and uh, of issues of, of marital sexual assault legal inequalities and equalities in the justice system, all of these are more focused on, on second wave feminism. So this is where Keller fits in, and we'll talk about why in a moment, but if we keep going forward then, uh, after second wave feminism, we get to what's referred to as third wave feminism. So it's definitely, a, a, a we see this third wave of feminism um, coming to the fore in the 1990s. There's a question of whether we're still in this third wave or whether we have actually, proceeded onto what we refer to as fourth wave feminism. And you get a, a disagreement regarding that uh, from different feminist theorists. Um, but essentially, yeah, third wave feminism was, um, yeah, more intersectional, meaning that it was a focus on what we call layers of oppression. So that, uh, well, I guess the criticism of, 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 of second wave feminism from third wave feminism was that second wave feminism was a very white woman's feminism. Uh, there was not really a focus on the differing experiences of uh, different women or women in, in, uh, uh, with, with uh, different lived experiences. So there's very little focus on women of color, for instance, in second wave feminism, or queer women, or uh, women from, uh, uh, or, or uh, trans women, th these types of issues, uh, really come to the fore with third wave feminism. Uh, at the same time, we see this reclamation of the body. So second wave feminism would have been, uh, and again, this is a, a, you know, a general claim, but certainly not true of everyone, but generally you see second wave feminism as being opposed to uh, things like pornography or uh, sex workers as being harmful or detrimental to women. And what you see in third wave feminism is sort of a reclamation of uh, women's bodies, uh, women's own bodies to say that, well, you know, what I want to do sexually is my choice with my body, right? And that uh, that, that sex work and pornography are not things to be demonized. Um, yeah, so uh, we see this, you know, proceeding through the 1990s. It's often associated with like uh, the, the riot girl movement in, uh, in, mu in music. So people like Bratmobile, Slater Kinney, um, uh, L7. Uh, yeah, a lot of these like really, really good sort of indie punk feminist bands of the 1990s. Uh, yeah, so um, like I said, there's this question about whether now we've moved into this fourth wave feminism. If we have, this is really exemplified in the Me Too movement. 
And so there's talk that like from the 2010s onward, specifically from 2017 onward, you get this focus more on uh, issues of workplace harassment, campus sexual assault, uh, Me Too, Time's Up. Um, and I, I think the best way I've heard this described is like a general exasperation and frustratedness that we're still dealing with these same issues we've been dealing with for, for generations. So um, Keller's work is decidedly a second wave feminist work, right? Not a focus on different lived experiences, but a focus on equality and neutrality among the genders. Um, yeah. So if you look at the bibliography for this, it was published in 1985. The question is like if if second wave feminism is dying out at uh, at this point, you know why so late here? Uh, you know, in comparison to when we see these movements of feminism, and one answer is simply that like the sciences sort of move slower with these types of cultural or societal changes. Uh, you see different questions and different waves of feminism uh, occurring first, maybe in the humanities, in queer studies, feminist studies, gender studies. Uh, in philosophy and sociology and, 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 and these types of movements, and it sort of trickles down to the sciences. So the sciences are a bit more conservative, sciences move a bit slower. So while you might find in the, the late 1980s, you know, people like uh, Bell Hooks writing these decidedly third wave feminist works in the sciences, you still see what is firmly situated in the 1960s, 1970s, second wave feminism. So what are her claims? Her claims regard this genderization of the sciences, right? Which is sort of defined as we defined it last class, though I don't think we used the term, that this genderization of the sciences is that, uh, is this belief that there's something masculine about doing the sciences, about doing scientific work, that to be rational or objective in the ways that science requires is to be masculine, or these are traits that men are most suited to, right? Um, yeah, right. So uh, on the opposite end, then to be irrational, subjective, superstitious, non-reflective is to be feminine. These are feminist traits. So, you know, it's if you take these stereotypes at face value and they're false, but if you took them at face value, then you would say if men are naturally predisposed predis to be objective and rational, then they're naturally just going to be more suited to the sciences than women who have to work against their natural traits of irrationality, subjectiveness, uh, 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 um, sort of you know, emotional, uh, that women are gonna be less successful because if they are, they have to work against what comes naturally to them. I mean, this is you know, nonsense, but this is what this genderization says, that science, to do science is to be masculine, thus men are more suited to the sciences. Yeah, I mean, Keller writes, and again, she's writing this in the 1980s, but that, uh, you know, a woman is being rational is said to be thinking like a man, while a man who's being irrational is said to be acting like a woman. I mean, these are a bit anachronistic now. I don't I think we would sort of, I would hope, uh, <laughs> react in horror if we ever heard someone describe someone like that and uh, immediately report them to their supervisors wherever the, whatever profession we found ourselves in, especially in the sciences. Um, but yeah, I think they do sort of speak to this underlying assumption that there's something masculine about doing the sciences, even if you don't, even if you would not hear, or you would hope to not hear someone say it outright in, in the same way that she had said someone wouldn't. Right. Um, yeah, she says this generation of the sciences starts from a very early age. Children identify sciences as the work of men and scientists as men, right? So she had said like, you know, even in her instance, she has, uh, she says her, her own son, claims that science scientists are, are, are men in the face of observational evidence, right? In the face of the fact that his mother is this theoretical physicist with a PhD from Harvard. Uh, even in that, I mean, you can see just how deeply ingrained these are that even in that instance, uh, you know, you, you, you have such a strong genderization there that it flies in the face of observable evidence. And she also talks about this, and I had largely tried to avoid these discussions when we were talking about science and pseudoscience and what might count as a science. And it seems like that middle, you know, maybe category with psychology and sociology, we might refer to those as, or you, you might have heard them referred to as the soft sciences, uh, whereas the hard sciences are something like physics and chemistry and biology and, and these types of things. Um, yeah, I mean, Keller, I think, is absolutely right that, like, even this becomes a sexual metaphor, right? The hard sciences are the male-dominated sciences, while the soft sciences are more associated with, uh, with with women, like sociology and psychology. They're not, and, and we rank sciences based on hard or soft sciences based on how rigorous they are, how objective, 
you know, how concrete they are versus speculative. So the more concrete is the more masculine. Hard sciences, the more speculative, like psych or sociology are uh, the soft or the feminine sciences. Right? And even with that, we view scientists as more masculine than people in other professions. Uh, Jeff Goldblum in, uh, in, in, uh, in Jurassic Park is a great example of this, right? So yeah, Keller has this great discussion on, um, she has this quote, on 78 regarding this. He says, you know, it's strange that the arts are associated with sexual pleasure and the sciences with sexual restraint. The arts man is seen as having a good looking, well-dressed wife with whom he enjoys a warm sexual relation. The scientist is having a wife who is dowdy and dull and in whom he has no physical interest. Yet the scientist is seen as masculine and the art specialist as slightly feminine, right? So yeah, it seems like we even associate amongst other professions, uh, that the sciences are somehow more masculine or more male dominated than other professions. That there's something perhaps a bit effeminate about being in this example an artist, despite the sort of the, 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 the sexual stereotypes regarding men in, in both professions. So where does this generalization come from? What's the origin of these myths that the sciences are male or masculine in nature uh, and that men are more suited to the sciences than women? And he says, she just says, oh, I can tell you where they don't come from. They don't come from just the mere fact that there are more men in the sciences than women. They don't come from mere gender disparities in the sciences. Just there are a lot of fields that are predominantly filled by men. Uh, accounting is a predominantly male field. Chefs are predominantly men. Painters are predominantly men, right? I mean, most professions at one time or another because of gender discrimination were the were predominantly the professions of men because women were not allowed to hold jobs, were not allowed to get educations, were thought to that a woman's role was in the house with the, the, the domestic life, all of these harmful prejudices. Every field at some point was a male dominated field, but we don't see accounting being associated with men and masculinity or cooking or painting in the same way that masculinity seems to be central to the identity of the sciences, right? So we wouldn't say that, you know, accounting is the, the, the domain of men or, sh or cooking or painting, right? Um, and what she's gonna say is like, that there are more men in the sciences is an effect of this genderization, not its cause. That we already have these views about gender in the sciences, so we ha simply have more men encouraged to, to participate in the science. That women are discouraged from going into the sciences because of this genderization. So, when there are less women in the sciences, that is an effect of that generalization. It doesn't cause it, it's a product of it. So where does it come from then? Not biology, obviously, right? There's nothing, there's, there's, there's nothing biologically in the, uh, the, the, the male sex that makes them more apt to succeed in the sciences, right? Our generalization of the sciences is entirely socially constructed. So why? Why does this come up? And what she does is she says, to investigate this, we need to go back to this uh, most basic gender stereotype, this idea as the male is active to the female or the woman is passive, or the male is science and the woman is nature, or more specifically, the male is subject and the woman is object. So yeah, she, this is the start of like the second half of this essay where she starts discussing um, the birth of objectivity or the development of objectivity, the development of gender, these types of things where she's using this idea of developmental psychology to trace the origins of this generalization of the sciences. That uh, to understand why the sciences are associated with men and masculinity, you need to understand where this original stereotype of the ma male as subject and the female as object, or the male as masculine or the self and the woman as passive or the object. It does, yeah. I mean, if you're not sold by her solution here, um, I'm not going to fault you for that. The whole thing does feel a bit speculative. So the question is like, is she correct here? And yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it's a good story and I don't say that to be to, to, to be dismissive of her, um, of her work. I think it leads us to uh, insights about the origins of, of gender stereotypes, whether or not you would talk to a developmental psychologist and they would say like, yeah, this is how pe children develop. So I don't know if it's true or not, but I think it's certainly useful to understanding these gender uh, I, uh, uh, stereotypes. Yeah, like I said, it's a good story. And I don't mean that to be you know insulting or pejorative or anything. 
uh, I think, you know, like any good story, uh, it leads us to truths, even if it is not its, itself true. Rather, the, I, I guess the truth of it is sort of largely irrelevant. Um, yeah, so with what I do in philosophy, this is similar to like some of the stories that philosophers have told us regarding our own development as a human species or the development of ethics. So someone like Friedrich Nietzsche or uh, Hegel would do this in their work. So Nietzsche writes this genealogy of morality where he tells this origin story of the Judeo-Christian morality as going back to the Hebrew slaves in ancient Egypt. I was just thinking about this because I was watching the Ten Commandments. It's my wife and I's tradition over uh, Easter is we'll make deviled eggs and watch the Ten Commandments because it's an awesome, Cecil B. DeMille is just, I mean, it's, it's Cecil B. DeMille and his element, right? Um, but Nietzsche tells this story about this idea of slave morality and all this Judeo-Christian morality coming from the time that Hebrews were slaves of the Egyptians. And I think if you talk to someone who did uh, you know, ancient history, they would say like Nietzsche's probably not right about this, but it does give us insights into the formation of, of the Christian ethic or the Protestant ethic in a way that's helpful, even if not true. Hegel does the same thing in the phenomenology of spirit. He tells the story of the master and the slave in a different sense than, uh, than Nietzsche, but as an idea of like the beginnings of subjectivity and domination over others. And again, it's like, is it true? Well, probably not, but it gives us good insights into things that are actually true, or it gives us good insights in how we think about our world. So when Keller is telling this, uh, this, this origin of this view in, in developmental psychology, there's a question of whether or not it's true, which is a question for developmental psychology. And there's a question as to whether or not it's useful, whether it's something that we, that gives us insights into this genderization. And while I don't know if it's true or not, I think her discussion here is certainly useful. So. Where does she find the origins of this view? And she goes all the way back to infant development, right? The first things that we learn, the first distinction that we make is between things that are me and things that are not me, right? Uh, that there are some things that I can identify as me, that I have control over, that are mine, and there are some things that are not, right? Before this, like everything else is just perceptions and sense data. Um, and, 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 you know, at this point, the first thing that we learn is that there is a self and there is an outside world, right? That I am the subject and everything else out there is not me. So this is the first distinction that we make. Before that, it's all sense perception. First thing I can do when I'm you know, laying in my crib or I'm in uh, a bassinet uh, or I'm in a walker or a stroller is to look around me and say, Okay, I'm looking at my hands, that's me. I'm looking at the sky, that's not me. I'm looking at my stroller, that's not me. I'm looking at a mobile above my crib, that's not me, right? This is the first distinction that I make. Right? What is subject, what is me, and what is not me? What are the objects out there in the world? Everything else that isn't me becomes an object out there in the world. And what Keller says is like the first not me that I encounter is typically of the mother. Now, this isn't always true, and I think that that is a legitimate criticism of her view that I will get back to at the end here. But typically, the first not me that I encounter is the mother figure. It's the not me that I'm most familiar with, right? Uh, among all of the objects out there, when I'm making this distinction between what's me and what's not, the mother is probably that not me that I interact with the most. I might interact with my stroller when I go for a walk, or I might interact with my mobile when I'm laying in my crib, uh, but it is my mother that takes me for a walk in my stroller. It is my mother that lays me down and takes me out of my crib. Um, again, not always true, but more often than not is. So, the mother is the first not me that I'm familiar with. It's the first other that stands in opposition to the self. In other words, I am me, and the mother figure that I see is not me. Pretty basic, right? So here's what she does with this thing. She says this distinction, this very basic infant distinction between me and not me, me as the subject as the self and the mother as not me or the object gives rise to the, the, this entire gender stereotype. So if the mother is not me, then the mother is the object and I'm the subject, right? Just like any other object out there in the world. Now, it's not like I treat her as an object as in she's no more important than my mobile or my stroller, that she's some inanimate object without thoughts or feelings. But in the sense of me as the subject and other things as objects in the world, she is an object in opposition to me as subject. And then just as like the mother is not me, then reflexively, I define myself as not mother or not object. 
the subject is another way of saying not object. To say that the mother is object is to say that mother is not subject. So I am the subject, I am not mother. Yeah, so what Keller says is this idea of the self becomes a negation of the mother. I as a self am not mother, not object. Right, so this negation over the opposition to the female gender often associated with the mother. The mother is female, therefore I am not female. So if the other is feminine, if the first other, the first object that I see has feminine qualities of, of mother, then the self must be in opposition to that. The not mother becomes not feminine, becomes masculine. Thus I define the self as masculine and the other as feminine. The subject is masculine because the other is, or the object is feminine. Yeah, the subject's the opposite of the mother. And what's cool about this idea is she says, this is true even for girls. It isn't like just like infant boys associate themselves with a masculine gender in opposition to the feminine mother. Girls do this as well. The sex of the infant doesn't matter here. Um, girls just sort of internalize this as being uh, themselves the female other to the male subject. This is a common theme in, uh, in, in, in gender studies and race studies and, and queer theory, this othering of the self, uh, which we can talk about if anybody wants to, to discuss this. This gets sort of far afield for what we're doing, but it's a really interesting concept if anybody wants to you know, set up a meeting or I can you know, point you towards some, some readings on, on this. But this is her sort of story here that once I say, I'm the self and the mother is the object, then the mother becomes, no, we're sorry, then the object becomes feminine and the self therefore becomes masculine. This is the origin. So in the genderization of the sciences, we learn very early in life that the sciences and, the, and subjectivity and the self are the domain of men and masculinity. That reason is the subject, re, rationality, the feminine, rather than the feminine other. Again, I'm not sold on this from a perspective of developmental psychology. And I think there are certainly good reasons to, to suspect this might not be the case. I mean, there's a lot of qualities of a primary caregiver. I had said, uh, you know, on the, you know, when I first introduced this, that it's not clear that the, the initial self is or sorry, the initial other is a mother figure. It might be a father figure. It might be a grandfather or a grandmother figure. It might be no mother figure at all for someone who uh, grows up in the foster care system. Um, we don't see those people having entirely different views about gender if they don't have a traditional mother figure to identify as object growing up. Now, Keller would probably just say, ah, but in a society, it's so common that the, the other, the first other is the mother figure that it becomes ingrained socially. So even those who don't have it themselves pick it up from living in a world where this is this sort of more generally true. Maybe. Um, yeah, I, I think, though, aside from that, you know, the, and again, this goes back to this idea of Keller's view being this very second wave feminist. She treats the mother as just a woman. But the mother figure is never just a woman. The mother figure is a woman who is also uh, a white woman or a person, a woman of color or a Latinx woman, or a queer woman, or a straight woman, or an Indian woman, or a Puerto Rican woman, or a Native American woman, or a, you get the idea here, right? Um, but it isn't clear that I associate the sciences with everything that is opposite of being Puerto Rican, or queer, or uh, uh, rich, or poor, or Latinx, or black, or whatever. Um, why is it that that's the trait that I pick out? Now, again, someone might say it's the most common for the mother. The mother has to be, well, it doesn't have to be, but the mother in most instances is female, whereas um, the mother in some instances is Puerto Rican or uh, rich or queer or black or Indian or, 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 or Native American or whatever, right? Um, that those are sort of more inconsequential to the mother figure. We can argue that if you want, but I think that would be her reply here. But I think, you know, what's important here is to take her main point. And her main point is that uh, the genderization of the sciences is harmful for the sciences. It's harmful both for women who want to do science, right? So it's harmful in that it marginalizes women's voices in the sciences. They're seen as less apt, less successful than their male counterparts. Um, this might get into issues that Merton talks about, about who we listen to and who we ignore in the Matthew effect, right? That uh, credit is withheld from women because of their gender in the sciences, and thus that becomes sort of self-repeating in the ways that he talks about as though, as in the ways that we give credit to those who already have credit. 
Um, so it's harmful for women who want to go into the sciences. Uh, pr you know, they're discouraged from doing so in the first place. And then even if they they uh, um, uh, overcome that initial discouragement and succeed in the sciences, their success is viewed differently than male success in the sciences. So this genderization is is harmful for women, um, but it's also harmful for science itself. It makes us in the ways that we talked about last class, when we talk about science as gendered, when we allow our gender stereotypes to play a role in the science that we do, we risk making errors in the ways that early primatologists did. Uh, we, we, we risk uh, not having, if we marginalize these voices, it becomes bad for science. Uh, it becomes harmful for the sciences to only have one perspective. We want more perspectives in the sciences. So what Keller says then is, Gender should be removed entirely from the sciences, right? We should not have these gender concerns in the sciences. Uh, we should eliminate gendered language. We should not focus on gender whatsoever. The scientists should be viewed as sort of a genderless, I don't know, brain or something, right? Uh, that these gender issues should have no importance in the sciences whatsoever. Yeah, science should be gender neutral. Now, what we're gonna see then next week is push back on this. I'd said this was a very sort of traditional view here that science should be gender neutral it is much more traditional, much more conservative. And I mean conservative as in more sort of, you know, uh, uh, less progressive, less sort of um, uh, radical than other positions. I don't mean to suggest it's more conservative as in it's the position of the conservative right in the United States or something like that, but more conservative and more traditional when compared to what we're going to see next week from well, our first reading from Sandra Harding, which claims that science should be concerned with gender. We shouldn't try to eliminate or ignore gender in science, but we should focus on gender differences in the sciences and that science works best when we do recognize and focus on gender differences. And then what we're gonna see on Wednesday is this essay on primatology specifically from Sandra Blafford Hardy that shows why some argue that gender is important in the sciences, that gendered voices rather than genderless voices become the more important, vo or not become important to the sciences of their gender, not in spite of their gender. So that's where we'll go from here. We're going to look at some more, like I said, more radical positions uh, next week. But for now, you should have everything to answer responsive for four if you're doing responsive for four. And remember, if you're happy with your first five response papers, there's no requirement to do responsive for four. Um, I will post the next video on Monday. This video is also posted to YouTube and the PDF is posted to the lecture PDFs folder as well. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions on anything, response paper six, uh, anything having to do with the final essay or anything like that, shoot me an email, we can set up some time to meet. If I don't hear from you, I will post grades sometime between now and Monday for response paper five. And if, uh, oh yeah, and then I'll just post the next uh, lecture on Sandra Harding for Monday. I will talk to you all then. Have a good weekend, be safe, wash your hands and all that. I'll talk to you soon.